Our first guest is Tony Heller. He's an environmentalist. He's a geologist with a BS in geology from Arizona State University. We like to play Tempe, eh? And an electrical engineer and teacher. He testified at his first congressional hearing in support of wilderness in 1972 and has a broad and successful career in science, education, environment, and engineering. He, he analyzes climate science claims and is the founder of realclimatescience.com. It's a real thrill to have you on, Tony. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Our, our, well, our audience is, uh, has been urging us and telling us to bring you on, and uh, I'm thrilled that uh, we could finally hook it up. I wanted to get your response to this. I was on Twitter, and I saw Elon Musk. He tweeted this out. He says, the only action needed to solve climate change is a carbon tax. Now, let me play this video for you. And then I'll let you uh, take it. You you can take it where you want. Okay. So this is um, this explains his whole view of climate change, and I think you'll have a lot to say about it. Here we go. What I'm going to talk about today is what is needed to address the climate crisis. What actions can we take that that will accelerate the transition out of the fossil fuel era? So th there's a certain amount of carbon that is circulating through the environment. So it's going into the air, beginning absorbed by plants and animals and then going back into the air, and this carbon is just circulating on the surface. And this is fine, and it's been doing that for millions, hundreds of millions of years. The thing that's changed is that we've added something to the mix. So this is what I would call the sort of the, the turd in the punch bowl. We added all this extra carbon to the carbon cycle, and the net result is that the carbon in the ocean's atmosphere is growing over time. It's much more than can be absorbed by the ecosystem. It's really quite simple. We're taking billions of tons of carbon that's been buried for hundreds of millions of years and is not part of the carbon cycle, taking it from deep underground and adding it to the carbon cycle. The result is that a steady increase in the, the carbon in the atmosphere and in the ocean, which doesn't look like much if you look at it on this chart, but when looked at in the context of, of history, it actually looks like this. So the carbon parts per million has really been bouncing around the 300 level for around 10 million years. And then in the last few hundred years, it went into a vertical climb. This is the essence of the problem. This is very unusual and a very extreme threat, as you can see from this rate of growth. Then this is accompanied by a temperature increase, as one would expect. Then this temperature increase, you know, people talk about two degrees or, or three degrees. It's important to appreciate just how sensitive the, the climate actually is to, to temperature. And it's important to look at it in terms of absolute temperature, not in degrees Celsius relative to zero. We need to say, what is the temperature change relative to absolute zero? That's how the universe thinks about temperature. It's how physics thinks about temperature. It's relative to absolute zero. For small changes result in huge effects. So New York City under ice would be minus five degrees. New York City under water would be plus five degrees. But looked at in a, as a percentage relative to absolute zero, it's only a plus minus two percent change. So the, the sensitivity of climate is extremely high. We've amplified this sensitivity by building our cities right on the coastline. And most people live very close to the ocean. There's some countries, of course, that are very low lying. And would be So let me just stop it there. I'm going to play the rest of it. But... I just want to, there's a lot of stuff he already said that I'd like to run past you. Well, first of all, what would you like to say to what you just saw? Well, er every single thing he said was complete nonsense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what about the background music? Did I, what about yeah, the barefoot the walking shots? I mean, he's not just <laughs> saying this because he's selling electric cars, right, Tony? <laughs> that, that's exactly why he's selling it. He's in the green energy business. Um, his income depends on it. And and it, it was it was nonsense from start to finish. I mean, the first thing you have to realize is that where did all this coal come from? Um, back in the Carboniferous era, a few hundred years, million years ago, um, we had very verdant forests, and things grew very quickly. And then they trees fell down in the swamps. They turned into peat, which turned into coal. So. He, he was saying that this carbon is something new. It's not something new. It's old carbon that was in this that's been and always been in the system. And we know from geological history that life does extremely well at high levels of carbon dioxide. That we, these these tremendous forests that grew in the Carboniferous era is where our coal beds came from. The greatest expansion of life on Earth occurred 540 million years ago during the Cambrian era. 
And that's when corals and shellfish evolved. There was this huge explosion of life in the oceans. Carbon dioxide levels were at their peak 15 times higher than they are now. So we know that not only does land life do well at high levels of carbon dioxide, but ocean life does extremely well at it too. So his, you know, his can understanding I just, of this is just wrong. So I covered this just a few months ago on this show. The NASA thing? The so NASA, yeah, so yeah, NASA yeah, yeah. in I think 2018 maybe released a study. Nobody reported it. I don't even know how I found it. But they showed that because we've been increasing carbon into the atmosphere, there's been a greening of the planet and that the it was some kind of crazy amount of more green plant like the size of Australia is more. That's how many more green plants there are in in the world than there was like 20 years ago because of the increase in carbon. And that makes sense because plants eat carbon and that you need carbon to make plants. And so Na that was NASA saying that. Uh, of course, they didn't say that 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 means we shouldn't try to stop putting carbon in the air, which doesn't make sense. Can you speak to any of that? Yeah, I mean, this has been understood for a long time. In 1920, Scientific American did a study where they, they piped industrial carbon dioxide in, over crops and showed this tremendous increase in crop yield um, from, from taking industrial carbon dioxide from an industrial facility and just covering covering the crops with it. You know, every commercial greenhouse in the world greatly increases the amount of carbon dioxide inside the greenhouse in order to make the plants go faster. And it also makes them more drought resistant. Um, in 1921, there was a study done by a German scientist where, where he said the key to feeding the, the, the future population of the world is increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He said we're, our atmosphere is deficient in carbon dioxide and, and we can greatly increase crop yields by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this has been known for a long time that our, our atmosphere is carbon deficient. And the way to feed people, the way to make crops grow faster is to increase the amount of carbon dioxide. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We get record crop yields year after year, partly due to the increase in carbon dioxide. Wait, what about uh, the flooding? I'm curious about that. So, so uh, let me. You know what? Let, let me. Uh, look, Kurt has a question about does it. So right now we're experiencing flooding in California. We're having what they call atmospheric rivers, uh, which means it's just raining a lot. And um, when I first moved to Los Angeles, it was raining a lot too. In 1996 or seven, they had what they called an El Nino, and it, felt, it rained every day for like a month. I remember when I first moved here. And so uh, now we're having uh, it rained five inches last night alone in Los Angeles. I, I meant the thing that he was saying about if the temperature is up five degrees, it's New York underwater. Like, is is that not a valid concern? The idea of the sea levels rising, or is you know, there, there, there's been sea levels been rising for twenty thousand years. You know, twenty thousand years ago, sea level was four hundred feet <laughs> lower. People walked across the Bering Strait from Russia to North America. That's how people got here originally. Sea level rose very quickly from about um, 3,000 years ago until about 9,000 years ago. I mean, from I mean, from about 12,000 years ago until about 9,000 years ago. It's rising much more slowly now. There's no indication. There's no legitimate indication that sea level rise has accelerated. Um, in 1989, NASA's James Hansen, the guy who started the global warming scare before Congress, predicted that Lower Manhattan would be underwater by 19 by 2018, and obviously it hasn't happened. There hasn't been any increase in the rate of sea level rise. So yes, yeah, sea level is rising, but it's been rising for 20,000 years, and it's nothing new, and it hasn't accelerated. So he showed one of those graphs there, and that's I think one of them, correct me if I'm wrong, is what the Al Gore also used, and they call it the hockey stick graph. But they're starting their graph from like the 1800s. They're not starting it from, say, a 10 million years ago. They're starting it from a point that is convenient for their argument. Is that correct? Well, the hockey stick graph is completely fake. Um, oh. the, the, the entire thing, it's just junk science. It was politically motivated. There's no scientific basis to any part of that diagram. Um, and it's, you know, it's currently on trial at the Mark Stein trial. Um, there, there's a lot of, 
they're, they're, Michael Mann's been suing Mark Stein for defamation over his criticisms of the hockey stick graph. So Mark Stein has just been destroying Mann in court over the last couple of weeks, just bringing in one expert after another, showing that that the hockey stick is fraudulent and is really bad science. And he's also been exposing a lot of Michael Mann's bad behavior, horrible things which he said about other scientists, misogyny, sexual accusations against female scientists. Um, so it's it's been pretty entertaining. We're hoping hoping that get some good news out of that trial and have Michael Mann look pretty bad. You know, the guy that know. directed Heat. No, no, I'm joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I love his movies, but I didn't know. Anyway, are, are, uh, are are you are you saying that the temperature is not increasing year over year, or that we're not responsible for it? Um, you know, if, if you look at the, the, the whole temperature, things very complicated. There was a very strong warming from about 1880 until about 1940. And then temperatures cooled dramatically during the 1970s. We had this Ice Age scare. Um, there was this great Leonard Nimoy I show remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's why they were saying cooling was because the temperatures had dropped. Right. Okay. In 1978, the New York Times ran a big story. No end in sight to 30-year cooling trend. And then after that, things start warming again. So there's sort of cyclical warming from 1880 to 1940, and then cooling, and then it's been warming again since about 1978. So, um, and this coincides with certain ocean cycles, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and the Pacific de decadal oscillation both shifted around 1977 or 1978. The temperature graphs that we see showing sort of continuous warming since 1910 or so are fake. They're, they're not based on legitimate science. If you look back and see what sort of coverage they had of the Earth, um, it was very low. There was good coverage from the United States. There was good coverage from Western Europe, Japan, and parts of Australia. But there was almost no temperature data from Africa, um, South America, Antarctica, most of Asia, most of Russia. So these graphs you see showing, you know, this warming since 1900 or so are not based on actual scientific data. They're just making up numbers for um, most of that interval. And even now, the coverage is terrible now. There's, in, in a typical month, there is no data from the Congo. The Congo is a huge country, six times the size of Texas. They have no temperature data. Uh, much of Africa, there's no temperature data. Most of Antarctica, they don't have any temperature data. Um, so you think that they want you to believe that that these very precise graphs they're showing of temperature increase are legitimate, but they're not. Once again, they're just they're political documents. They're not scientific ones. Well, I can tell you this. So the reason why I was excited to have you on is because when I would watch an, a video like Elon Musk, I believed it. I believed everything, everywhere, you know, and and then Russiagate happened in 2016. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with climate? Well, what that showed me is that when the establishment wants to manufacture a narrative and wants to manufacture a crisis, they can do it and they can get most everybody to believe it. And they've been doing it now, Russiagate, for eight years, and it led to a war in Ukraine. Americans would not be on board for the war in Ukraine if they knew actually how it started and if they didn't think that Putin overthrew our election in 2016 and that Trump was working with them. That was all made up. That was all revealed to be made up uh, because the FBI and the Clinton campaign, the Clinton campaign made up the P dossier that was all made up and paid for by Hillary Clinton, by the way. And then she lied to the FBI about it for a year, said she didn't pay for it. And of course she did. And then the FBI lied to the FISA court 17 times so they could get ta taps on Donald Trump's phone. And so this isn't a, this isn't me saying I like Donald Trump. This is me letting you know that when the establishment wants to lie to you, they lie to you. And when they want to make up a narrative, they make up a narrative covid was mostly made up uh, uh their their solutions to it the lockdown had no scientific basis uh masks had no scientific basis we took an um, uh, an emergency medical author uh, authorized vaccine they had to change the definition of what vaccines were 
for us to call that a vaccine. There's so many. Th- so they well, also, they lied about uh, natural immunity. They lied about herd immunity. They lied about transmission. They lied about contraction. And everybody still believes the lies. And I'm here at this show to debunking it. So when I saw that they could pull off something like Russiagate, which they're still pulling off, by the way, people still think Donald Trump was somehow a traitor to our country in bed with Russia and Putin, yet they investigated him for years and years and nobody could find any evidence of it, including Robert Mueller, who said there's no evidence to, for any of that stuff. That doesn't make a difference. They're still going to say that every night, 24-7 on MSNBC and CNN, they're still going to say it. That doesn't make it true. So when I can see that the establishment can make you think that a life-saving medicine like ivermectin that has been prescribed mil- billions of times, saved billions of lives, won the Nobel Prize for Human Medicine, it's on the WHO list of essential medicine, and they can convince everyone that you're some kind of redneck crazy conspiracy theorist if you think that's a human in medicine that is the power of propaganda and i'm starting to believe i know for sure now i don't know so what you're saying about climate Wait, change jimmy is, what, the, here's the simplest thing all the predictions they made since have, i was a kid have not come true. Have not come true i feel like a goddamn jehovah's witness again the world didn't end that, and they go well that just means you have to be even more scared because it could be any time that's right they, it, nothing not, came true nothing, that they said they said that we're going to have arctic uh, ice free summers by 2014 that's why i showed joe uh, john Kerry and al gore saying that of course it didn't happen greta Thunberg said we would be underwater five uh two years ago and then uh, so my, my my point is so whether you agree that climate change is a problem that we need to address and that carbon is causing it, whether you agree with that or not, I know for a fact that the solutions that they're proposing to fix that problem are all bullshit. Those are all completely made up narratives, just like Russiagate was made up, just like their solutions to COVID was made up, just like everything they're saying. Of, uh, it, so th- they're going after what well, we're going to show it in a second. But in California, they outlawed gas-powered lawnmowers and gas-powered leaf blowers. You know what they didn't outlaw? Private jet travel. One private jet, <laughs> one private jet flight, uh, it burns more carbon than my car does in my whole lifetime. Yet those people take their private jets to conferences so they can write laws like that and come up with the ideas to fix climate change. Uh, so making f- small. Uh, uh, far, uh, small businesses that do landscaping in California go out of business because they can't afford to re-upgrade all their uh, all their equipment. So you know who can afford all new battery power stuff? Amazon. Uh, uh, if they want to open up a landscaping business, they can do it. So my point is, I know for a fact that gas stoves are not a problem. I know for a fact that lawn blowers and leaf blowers are not, and certainly Dutch farms are not the thing. You'll never see Greta Thunberg out there. You'll never see her protesting the new opening of a military base, even though the number one carbon emitter in the entire planet is the U.S. military. She will not. She'll go to Ukraine and cheer on a war, which again, of course, is is is. is hell look at the Nord Stream pipeline did she say a word about that the biggest release of methane in the his no she didn't say anything but she will go to an oil thing and so it's all made up I know every she's a psyop we already revealed that on this plan so it's a uh, I, I know this is a psyop being played on me, the solutions to climate change and now people like you come along to tell me that actually climate change is uh, also junk science. And so that's why I'm telling you that. So even if you don't believe it, what Tony Heller's saying, and even if you believe that climate change is a problem, I can tell you for a fact that the solutions they have for it are bullshit because the people like John Kerry and Bill Gates and the and uh, Joe, uh, Joe Biden and Greta Thunberg, they're as soon as they tell people to ban private jet travel and to close down the 800 military bases the United States has around the world, I'll believe that they're serious about fighting climate change. But they're not calling for that, which shows you they're not serious about fixing a problem that they've self-defined. Well, so paper straws so but they will tell you the paper straws are bad and gas stoves in your house are bad uh so let me just uh let me play the rest of this video tony unless you want to say something to what i just said well i just want to throw one thing out i mean if you look at who's where where the carbon's actually coming from it's coming from china and asia you know the uh north america um europe and the other continents could drop off the face of the earth and emissions would, and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would continue to rise. 
because it's all controlled by Asia at this point, and China in particular. China has 655 new coal-fired power plants in the works. They're building, that's how many they have planned or under construction. That's more than are in the whole United States. Um, and if, and so who are, where are they protesting? They're not protesting in China. They're protesting in, in North America and Europe and, and Australia and places where it doesn't make any difference. If they were serious, if they actually believed carbon dioxide was a problem, they would be going after China. But the fact that there is a kid's glove, you know, kid gloves approach to China while they're attacking us, um, where our carbon emissions have been declining for 30 years and they're much lower than China. So that, that's a to me that's the number one indicator that's, that this is a scam is that they're not actually going after the the people who are actually producing the carbon. That's dioxide. exactly my point. If they really believe that carbon was responsible for climate change and all the horribleness that they attribute to climate change, they would go after the number one emitter of cli of carbon, which is the U.S. Right. military. They're not going after that. They're not going after China. They're not telling people to stop flying in private jets. In fact, ja private jet travel is is uh, exploding. So uh, and Bar and Barack Obama would not be fine. And John Kerry would not be buying beachfront property at sea level, which is what they're doing. And uh, so and Barack Obama goes to Africa and he tells Africans, you're not allowed to have you. We can't af the world can't afford you to have air conditioning and have a car because the planet will uh, overheat. But then he goes and buys a 48 acre house. How many air conditioners do you think he has in that motherfucker? And then and, he, and he, and he not, only, not only bought a house, that house on the beach at, at Martha's Vineyard, um, but he, um, he applied for a 5,000-gallon propane tank to put on the property. <laughs> and he also is putting in seawalls, which they have environmental laws against because it causes beach erosion downstream, right. and he doesn't care. He got a cutout from the government to build a seawall in front of his mansion and Maui, which you're not supposed to be able to do that, but I guess if you're Barack Obama. So those people who are telling us that we can't have air conditioning and we can't have cars and we have to get rid of our stoves and we can't travel, those people are liars because if they really believe that, they would be living in one-bedroom apartments and they'd be uh, riding bikes everywhere. But since they're not doing, in fact, they're doing the exact extreme opposite of that. I'm not trying to tell somebody who wants to fight climate change that they can't have a house and they can't have air conditioning. Barack Obama has at least three houses. He has one. He, I bet he's running 80 air conditioners. OK, I bet he's flying on private jets all over the goddamn place. So and he's putting in uh, seawalls that cause a uh, uh, road beach erosion. They don't care. This is about control of you, just like COVID was about control of you and your vaccine passports and social credit scores and central banking digital currency this is all about a handful of billionaires want to have control over everybody and so they're using climate change as a reason to do this and it doesn't matter if you believe that if climate change is real and it's a serious problem or not the solutions that they're proposing are bullshit Greta Thunberg is a sci is a psyop. Barack Obama, John Kerry, and anybody else who talks about climate change are bullshitting you at the top of their lungs at full speed, just like they bullshitted you about climate change, just like they bullshitted you about I mean about Russia Gate, just like they bullshitted you about COVID and lockdowns and masks and transmission and contraction and natural immunity and herd immunity. All they're bullshitting you with a straight face because that's what they do and they have. That's why censorship has exploded in the last couple of years, because they can't lose control of the narrative because that's all they got. Once they lose control of the narrative, then people rise up and overthrow their governments. And so that's why censorship is so strong. And that's another reason why they now are uh, they're criminalizing their political opponents, not only here in the United States, where they're doing it with Stop Cop City and Donald Trump and MAGA. They're doing it in uh, um Pakistan, the most popular politician in the history of Pakistan. They just outlawed him from running for government. Why? Because he, he stood up against NATO. Same thing in uh, in Brazil. They put Lula in prison because he was too far left for the uh, billionaire class that runs everything. And then uh, they thought the center-right guy was going to win. And then Bolsonaro won, which was 
like the Trump of uh, Brazil. They couldn't control him. They're like, oh, my God, we got to get rid of that guy. So what do they do? They let Lula back out of prison because they know he's the only one who could beat Bolsonaro in an election. He beats him. And then they just criminalize Bolsonaro and he can't run for president ever again. This is the game that's being played. It's all about control. And climate change is part of that. And so uh, just just like uh, DEI is a part of that. So so companies like BlackRock and Vanguard, when they go around raping the planet and screwing workers, they can wrap themselves in a patina of virtue by saying, look, I'm for lesbians and I'm for trans and I'm for I'm against white supremacy. And I'm good. And that's those are the people who are your biggest enemy are wrapping themselves in that woke language. And that's the same thing that's happening with climate change. So I have a question. Go um, ahead. All the when I was a kid, you know, I first heard that global cooling thing, I think from like Rush Limbaugh or so, at the time, all the oil companies were like, oh, what are you talking about climate change? And a weird transition happened sometime after that Gulf spill, where now all the oil companies were like putting it on on you. I mean, <laughs> like, mean the Exxon Valdez, like your carbon footprint from no, no, yeah. but not Valdez, the the one in Texas, the you know, the big uh, when Obama was in the Gulf. Spill. BP. Oh, that well, the BP in BP the Gulf invented the carbon footprint. That's from BP. So why are oil companies now on board? With this shit of like my carbon footprint, I, when did that happen? Yeah, and by and and I already t covered this on the show. When you take your recyclables and you put it in your recycling bin and you separate them, they all go in the same hole. They stopped doing that. They stopped recycling recyclables when China stopped taking our recyclables because it wasn't economically profitable for them. So now no matter what you do, and I've covered it on this show, I've covered it on this show since 2017 when I was still at the Young Turks. They take your garbage, no matter if it's recyclables or not, and they drive it to the same goddamn hole. Um, I, mean, I was asking, though, does he know? Do, do, does Tony know why that has the... the Oh, so Tony, what do you what? Can you comment on what Kurt said about that? It, it's BP who invented the term carbon footprint, and now we're supposed to all ha worry about our own personal carbon like, footprint. Why did they switch switch up like that? Is yeah. Question. Why did they switch? Well, there's probably several reasons, and you can be sure all of them involve making money. I mean, one reason is just to avoid criticism. They've been you know, viciously attacked as funding climate change deniers. I'm constant. People constantly accuse me of getting money from big oil. Um, I've been doing this for 16 years. I'm still waiting for the check must be lost in the mail because I haven't gotten it. So I think that's one reason. But they're probably also invested to have some other investments and in other types of energy. Um, I would assume. I, I don't really know the details of it, but. It, it's 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 got to be a financial decision that that um oh is it like truth.com for cigarettes the cigarette companies paid remember truth.com yes. cigarette it was all this like smoking's bad and cigarette companies were paying for that yeah. Just like they're paying for the anti-vaping laws <laughs> that's all tobacco companies paying for that so i'm just telling you that that be Russia Gate was the thing that really opened my mind to the game that's being played on us on several different fronts. And I know a lot of mainstream news journalists, fastball down the middle, they would never speculate about something unless they didn't have facts to back it up, have told me off the record that they now doubt climate change because of the lies that they've been fed over the last decade by the establishment. They now doubt all of it. So I'm gonna let me play the rest of this and then we'll bring you back in. Completely underwater in the climate crisis. We, we've essentially designed civilization to be super sensitive. The important thing to appreciate is that we are going to exit the fossil fuels era. So it is inevitable that we will exit the fossil fuels era because at a certain point we will simply run out of carbon to mine and burn. So the question is really, when do we exit the era, not if? The goal is to exit the era as quickly as possible. That means we need to move from the old goal with a pre-industrial goal, which was to move from chopping down forests and killing lots of whales. That, the old goal was to move from chopping wood and killing whales to fossil fuels, which actually, in that context, was a good thing. But the new goal is to move to a sustainable energy future. And we want to use things like hydro, solar, wind, geothermal. Nuclear is also a, a good option in places like France, which don't aren't subject to natural disasters. And we want to use energy sources that will be good for a billion years. So how do we accelerate this transition away from fossil fuels to a sustainable era? And what happens if we don't? So if we wait, and if we delay the change, the, 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 the best case is simply delaying that inevitable transition to sustainable energy. 
So this is the best case if we don't take action now. At the risk of being repetitive, there, there's going to be no choice in the long term to move to sustainable energy. It's tautological. We have to have sustainable energy or we'll simply run out of the other one. So the only thing we gain by slowing down the transition is just slowing it down. It doesn't make it not occur, it just slows it down. The worst case, however, is more displacement and destruction than all the wars in history combined. Okay, this is, these are the best worst case scenarios. So then we have yeah, about 3% of scientists that believe in the best case, about 97% that believe in the worst case. This is why I call it the dumbest experiment in history ever. But why would you do this? The, the transition is delayed or, or, or is happening slowly is because there is a hidden subsidy on all carbon producing activity in a healthy market. So he said that climate change will be more destructive than all the wars in history and that only 3% of climate scientists don't subscribe to the things he's saying and 97% of them do. Well, I think you could have said the same thing about uh, Russiagate. 97% of news journalists believe in Russiagate, only 3% less than that. Believe we me. We own the science believe, is what I remember. <laughs> yeah, remember we own the science yeah. and Tony said and so you could have said the same thing about COVID policy that most of the scientists agree with on COVID policy and all, but but it's because they censored all the ones that had. Uh, so do you believe what, when when you now I question that I used to say the same things everything he's saying I used to say. So uh, what do you say when he you see somebody like uh, Elon Musk say only three percent of climate scientists don't subscribe to this? It, it's once again it's complete nonsense. Um, Barack Obama's started that number up 10 years ago. Yeah, I remember that. Um, he, he, in a tweet. And that that same year, the American Meteorological Society took a survey of their professional members. Only 50% believed that global warming was primarily man-made. Um, so Barack Obama bumped that up from 50% to 97%. He also said that they 97% believed global warming was dangerous. They were never even asked that question because they would have laughed because it's ridiculous. There's no indication that extreme weather has gotten worse. Um, global death rates from all types of natural disasters, including weather, are down 95% over the last century. Um, none of none of the information which which um, you know Elon Musk just said was true. It was all nonsense. We're not we're not transitioning away from fossil fuels. The rate of growth of fossil fuels around the world is increasing very rapidly. It's increasing more rapidly than wind and solar, and there's a reason for it. It's because wind and solar are not reliable. When the wind's not blowing, you can't get wind powered energy. When the sun's not shining, you can't get solar powered energy. Our civilization requires continuous reliable power which you will never get from wind and solar and that's why the fossil fuel usage around the world is increasing he's talking about some sort of transition which is not occurring in the real world it just exists in the imagination of in fact people who are pushing this nonsense in fact barack obama and i could show you video after video of him bragging that under his administration, they produced more oil than on any other administration. Right. That they and so that's the guy who's warning us, tell, telling people in Africa you can't have air conditioning in cars because the earth is going to overheat. But he's also at the same time bragging about being the biggest driller and producer of oil in the history of the United States. Uh, well, do you think he's going to let them become the Saudi Arabia of minerals you need for batteries? Yeah. <laughs> so you think he's going to allow them to rise up and like? All the stuff Elon needs to make them cars, they have in Africa. That's right. And we're not going to, they're not going to live like Saudi princes, even though they have the, the energy of the future. And so here is Elon, here is Elon Musk's uh, solution to this. Watch this. He says that it's all about economics and that, and that uh, burning carbon and using uh, fossil fuels is incentivized economically. And here he'll show it to you. Let me back it up just a little bit. The problem. Activity. In a healthy market, if you have, say, 10 euros of benefit and 4 euros of harm to society, the profit would be 6 euros. It sort of you know, makes obvious sense. This is where the incentives are aligned with a good future. This is not the case today. But if you have the incentives aligned, then the forcing function towards a, a, a good future, towards a sustainable energy future, will be powerful. In an unhealthy market, you have your 10 euros of benefit, give you four euros, but the four euros isn't, isn't taxed. So you have an un, untaxed negative externality. 
It's basically economics 101. So you have basically unreasonable profit and a forcing function to do carbon emitting activity because this cost to society is not being paid. The net result is 35 gigatons of carbon per year into the atmosphere. So this is analogous to not paying for garbage collection. And it's, it's not as though we should say, in the case of garbage, have a garbage-free society. It's very difficult to have a garbage-free society. But it's just important that people pay for garbage collection. So we need to go from having an untaxed negative externality, which is effectively a subsidy of enormous size, $5.3 trillion a year, according to the IMF, every year. We need to move away from this and have a carbon tax. This is being fought quite hard by the, the carbon producers. And they're using tactics that are very similar to what the cigarette industry or the tobacco industry used for many years. They would, they would take the approach of, even though the overwhelming scientific consensus was that smoking cigarettes was bad for you, they would find a few scientists that would disagree. And then they would say, look, the scientists disagree. That's essentially how they would try to trick the public into thinking that smoking is not that bad. The solution, obviously, is to remove the subsidy. So that means we need to have a carbon tax and to make it something which is neither a left nor a right issue, we should make it probably a revenue neutral carbon tax. So this would be a case of increasing taxes on carbon, then re reducing taxes in, in other places. So maybe there would be a reduction in sales tax or VAT and an increase in carbon tax. So that only those using high levels of carbon would pay an increased tax. In, in order to give industry time to react, this could be a phased in approach. So that maybe it takes five years before the carbon taxes are very high. So that means that only companies that don't take action today will suffer in five years. But there needs to be a clear message from government in this regard, because the fundamental problem is the rules today incent people to create carbon. And th this is madness. And whatever you incent will happen. That, that's why we're seeing very little effect thus far. And depending on what action we take, we'll, we'll drive the, the carbon number to either extreme or, or moderate levels. I think it's pretty much a given that the two degree C increase will occur. The question is whether it's going to be much more than that, not if there will be a two degree increase. So the, then the question is, so what can you do? I would say whenever you have the opportunity, talk to the politicians, ask them to enact a carbon tax. We have to fix the unpriced externality. I would talk to your friends about it and fight the propaganda from the carbon industry. So that's the basic message I have. So you might be thinking, hey, Elon Musk is not a climate scientist. Uh, well, he's got a billion dollars, and that's why he gets to tell people what to do with the climate. Just like Bill Gates isn't a doctor or a farmer or a teacher, yet he gets to run his yap on that stuff, and every news organization covers it and pretends like he's some kind of uh, expert in anything he's talking about, whether it comes from vaccines or farming or climate or education or anything. Blotting and people don't sun. even want to real uh, blocking out the sun. People don't even want to don't even realize bill gates never even graduated college okay um so did you, is there anything left in that that you you'd like to cover because he's saying a carbon yeah. tax would fix would fix everything of course e i want to say to elon we need carbon to invade countries and mine rare minerals that we need to get make tesla batteries yeah. what are you going to do then we're not going to have enough tesla we're not going to have enough all right so go ahead tony yeah well first of all a carbon tax is the most regressive tax you can come up with because it hurts poor people the hardest, right? He can afford to pay more for his gasoline, but a poor person who has to drive to work, that's who it's going to hurt. Um, so it, it, it's an incredibly regressive tax. It doesn't serve any purpose. There has not been an increase in extreme weather. There's been no cost to using um, fossil fuels. And fossil fuels, you know, billions of people around the world depend on fossil fuels for day-to-day -day survival. The, the functioning of our civilization depends on this reliable supply of energy. And the only way we can do that is with fossil fuels. Wind and solar are not reliable. And there's we're not going to run out of fossil fuels anytime in the foreseeable future. There's massive reserves of methane on the sea floors, frozen in the sea floors and methane hydrates. I was studying this at Los Alamos 40 years ago. Um, 
And, and, you know, front page of the New York Times, the lead story 50 years ago this week was um, gas lines. The air, during the Arab oil embargo, they shut down our the supply of oil to the United States. And people were waiting for hours in line because there wasn't enough fossil fuels. Everybody was miserable. And he's talking about trying to do the same thing, trying to reduce our, the amount of the essential fuels which we need to survive and with no benefit, with tremendous cost, and it'll hit the poor hardest. I mean, what he's saying is, every I've never heard that much BS packed into such short period of time as what Elon said there. Tony, why, why wouldn't we listen to the same class of people who have started every war in history and then shat their pollutants across the landscape with the same level of concern for the immediate environment as a black bear breaking into your SUV for that role of Jolly Ranchers that it's in the council? I mean, that's what we're I'm done listening to the billionaire class on about the problems of the world and how to solve them. We know that any solution they come up with is going to help the billionaire class because they're always class loyal. And it's just like you said, it's going to hurt everybody else. And of course, he proposes the most aggressive tax ever, which is a carbon tax. Exactly right. That's who it's going to hurt people who have to travel to go to work. Yeah, it just it's it's just crazy the whole thing, and it's just there's no science behind it. Um, his, what he said about energy was wrong. What he said about the science was wrong. And if you look at who the one of the most vocal advocates against this this climate nonsense is the current Nobel Prize winner in physics, John Clauser. He's been very vocal that this is all nonsense. It's based on junk science. They don't listen to him. They don't listen to the Nobel Prize winner in physics. They listen to Greta Thunberg and Al Gore and people like that who don't know anything about science. Do, do you ever see John Clauser on the news? He he had a he had a speech scheduled to the International Monetary Fund. It was canceled after they found out that he didn't go along with their climate scam. Oh, the, so why would you badmouth the International Monetary Fund? All they've done is screwed over every small country and stolen their natural resources since their inception. Yeah, it's it, there's there's no that's that's the thing that you know I just want to emphasize. There's no science behind it. The science is wrong. The engineering is wrong. There's no benefits to it. And if they got what they were asking for, it would be a catastrophe. Um. And, and there's nothing the United States could do anyway. Like I said, the United States could drop off the face of the earth and the emissions are still going to continue to increase because China's building 655 new coal-fired power plants. Um, it, it, the whole thing's a farce. And I don't know what Elon's game is. Maybe he's ignorant. Maybe he's got some other agenda going on here. But what he's saying was not true. Not a single thing that he said in that video at any basis in reality. He sells electric cars. I he sells electric cars. That's his game. <laughs> yeah. That's his angle. Of course, that's his angle. And he wants to sell electric trucks and electric everything. Well, you think you think maybe he keeps knocking up all this, all these women because he wants to replace us with his own children? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> like that emperor He could just adopt me. What's that? He could just adopt me. Yeah, I wish he would adopt me. <laughs> Uh, Tony Heller, I really want to thank you for coming on and help in explaining your point of view about climate change and uh, to our audience, because uh, it's I, I know whatever you're hearing from the corporate media, they're lying to you about climate change. I just know it. I just know they're certainly lying to you about the solutions. And uh, I want, I'm not doing it until they ban private jet travel and until uh, John Kerry and Barack Obama and Joe Biden come out and call for the closing of 800 military bases around the world because we're the number one emitter of carbon. I'm not listening to a damn thing they say about climate change. And why would I? And you're a Trump. I think you're a Trump if you do. Uh, everybody could check out uh, Tony Heller at realclimatescience.com. Is there anywhere else you like people to go direct people? Yeah, my, my videos on YouTube are probably the best way like, for me to get the information out. I make like generally like three to seven minute long videos just going over each topic, you know, the latest propaganda in the news and comparing that versus what the actual science is. I mean, it's usually pretty stunning the the gap between what they're saying and reality. And I'll, I'll, I've, I've posted Elon's video a few days ago, and I'll probably do an analysis of it, but that could take weeks. Yeah. I mean, the amount of garbage he spewed in that eight-minute video was was so overwhelming. I mean, I, I could probably break it up into 15 different videos 
And I probably will do that, actually. It sounds like a fun... fun What's the name of your YouTube channel? Is it just Tony Heller? Just Tony Heller, yeah. Okay, Tony Heller on YouTube. Check it out. I appreciate it. Thank you for making time. I believe in having a substantial percentage of my financial future secured with gold and silver. This is actually real. This is true. I'm putting about uh, 25% of my retirement. I never even thought about this stuff before. Yeah. That's why That's why I decided to partner with our sponsor, Colonial Metals Group. They helped me set up a safe and secure self-directed IRA. You know what that is, Jackie? Self-directed IRA, where I have access to my assets, no matter what the stock market, and for that matter, whatever the government is doing as well. Let the team of experts at Colonial Metals Group help you protect your family's future. We've put together a special offer for our audience. Click on the link in the description below or call our special 800 number and you'll receive a safe and up to 10 grand in free silver. Go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash Jimmy dash door dash show or call 888-910-1419. Hey, come see us do a live stand-up show. We'll be in Bend, Oregon, Portland, Seattle, Philadelphia, Avenal, New Jersey, Boston, Palm Springs, Ta Stockholm, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Berlin, and London. We're adding a second show in London. The first show sold out. See you there. Mm -hmm.